Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our new book again today, right out of the Minor Prophets, Zechariah. Now, Zechariah, meaning in the Hebrew tongue, remembered of or by Yahweh, or remembered of Yahweh, our Father. And it is ironic that this is, um, you might say, one of the most prophetic books among the minor prophets concerning your generation. So the name really says it all. It means at that time that God will remember, though he never forgot, understand, but it means he's going to take action. It is an idiom in a sense that means it's time for him to take action. Against who? Those that uh, would not study his word, those that would not obey him because they were ignorant of his word, those he's a little easier on, I suppose, but yet very disappointed, especially when our father himself would write this letter individually to his children, you, regardless of who you are. And this tells of that time, or, or you might say coming out of Babylon. You remember from the last lecture, lecture in uh, Haggai that Zerubbabel, meaning born in Babel, but came out, you're going to hear more of him in this great book because he's still going to build that building, that many-membered body, and you will learn a great deal about how it's structured, how it comes together, what it consists of. Okay, Zechariah covers a seven, a, approximately uh, a seven-year period, so seven being spiritual completeness and kind of the period of the last seven years, if you understand. Uh, in a prophetic sense at various places in it. So it is, a, it is one of the minor prophets that certainly is significant and one that you should strive to understand. Having said that, remembered of Yahweh. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Zechariah, and it reads, In the eighth month, that would be about our November, in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, remembered of Yah, the son of Berechiah, blessed of Yah, uh, the son of Edo, which is Ido, rather, which is the prophet saying, meaning lovely or timely. Verse 2, the Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Now, I... Uh, that word sore, you got to bear down on it pretty good. That's a little bit mild for how he feels about it. He's, his displeasure is uh, significant. It's even working itself to a point of wrath. All right? Verse 3. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, or you return unto me saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. You return to me and I'll return to you. That's God's deal. Now, this will be taught on a national sense, but at the same time, it holds on a personal sense as well. If you'll return to him, you don't have to even consider it. He will return to you. He will be with you. And when he is with you, I would, uh, I would have you to think of Berechiah, blessed of Yah. He will bless you. Uh, that's his guarantee. So think about it. Well, how do I return to him? By growing familiar with his word to the point that you can be pleasing to him. Verse 4, be ye not as your fathers, that's good advice, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me. They wouldn't listen, saith the Lord. 
Now, there are many ways of not listening. There are many people in this generation, as it was in, the, there's nothing new under the sun, as it was in the days of Jeremiah and the minor prophets, that think in their hearts that they're getting by pretty good, spiritually speaking. I'm going to just, I'm going to make a statement. If you're only listening to men and not studying God's word on your own, you're not doing so good. Because in the first place, if you could count on a teacher that would teach chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby you were being fed the real food that sticks to your ribs as far as spiritually speaking and pleasing God, you might do pretty good. But you can't go to a one verse Charlie and not study on your own to fill in the blanks because every time he skips from a verse here to there, you've got to cover everything in between to actually grasp the whole thought. God doesn't like people that study like Russian roulette. Well, I just opened the Bible and there it was. Who do, how do you know? If you just open the Bible and pick one verse, how do you know who God was talking to? You know, our Father is very intelligent and you, whether you realize it or not, are his child and he expects you to be intelligent. Don't, don't do stupid things. And that's stupid to just pop the, you know, anyone that has any understanding at all of literature, even our Father's Word, knows the principles, the rules, subject, object, um, and um, how to follow the thought. You gotta, you've got to rightly divide the Word of God, that is to divide it as to who it's written to, when it was written, what it pertains to, what the subject is, and one verse rarely would ever cut that or even come close. Anyway, I'm, I'm just saying some people think in their little minds that they might be pretty well off. They go to church all my life. I don't know anything about God's Word, but I've sure been there on that bench. That won't cut it. If you're biblically illiterate, you're biblically illiterate, period. Enough said. How do you break that? There's, maybe there's no shame in it. Just don't stay that way. He said, please listen to me. He didn't say please, but he gives you that prerogative, the, the, re, the, the right to have the prerogative to want to listen to him because you cut your own path, friend. And uh, because if God wrote this letter to you personally and you uh, have the ability of reading and studying you don't have to depend 100% upon man, meaning you're accountable to God, okay? Verse 5, your fathers, where are they? Well, they're dead, you know, physically. And the prophets, did they live forever? Uh-uh, they died. Meaning, physically they died. Their souls are not dead. They instantly returned to the Father that gave it. But what it's saying is, His Word lives forever. The prophets and the people don't. So we've kind of had forever, as far as that's concerned, to pick up on the Word. And this Word is going to hold true. So... And everyone that lives is going to die. What does that mean? Well, they die, and what, then what? They return to the Father for one or two things. One is to be rewarded, or two, to be judged. Judged in the sense of that that is negative. Meaning, you got a short time here on earth, and you'd better make good use of it. That means you'd better be pleasing your Father here if you expect there to be a hereafter, six. Let me rephrase that. If you expect to have a part in the hereafter, because there's definitely a hereafter. Verse 6. But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? You might say, did they not overtake them? You bet they did. And they returned and said, like as the Lord of hosts taught, thought to do unto us according to our ways... And according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. 
And, and that, that is, um, uh, you set your own course. Many people, God has to ch must chastise them. God must correct them. God must put holes in their buckets, trying to get their attention. And they just keep bloodying their head against the wall of life, learning over and over the hard way. So you set your own path, friend. And if you return to the Father and try to please Him, you're not going to be perfect. That's the beauty of having grace at this time. And that He accounts that as perfect. Once you repent and say, Father, please help me to understand what it is that, that pleases you, He's going to tell you in this book anyway. Pay attention to His commandments. They're the best advice in the world you can receive. I'll tell you something. If you listen to God's commandments, you'll never get in trouble. Um, it would be a rare thing that you would. Verse 7. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, and um, we move on here. This would probably be about our February in the eleventh month, which is the month of Sabbath in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of, of Iddu, the prophet, saying, now watch this, verse 8, pay attention. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. This would be a sorrel to you old cowboys, okay? And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behind him were there red horses, speckled, that's a bay, and white. Now, got about the same color we got here in Revelation concerning the horses, but these do not happen to be the four horsemen mentioned. And these are four scouts. Scouts usually went by horseback. And they're scouting out the earth is what they're doing. Why would he bring up the fact of um, myrtle trees? And uh, I, I would have you remember that in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 15, part of the booth, Sukkot, uh, that was made up at Feast of Tabernacles, uh, myrtle tree was one of the... Um, trees, uh, they, they would, they're really a brush tree. They only get about 10 feet tall, but that's enough for horses to hide in in, the, in a brushy grove. And um, they, they get about 10 foot tall, but they're one of the uh, palms and palm, let's see, how, how is it in Nehemiah? Palm tree, the olive, the palm, the pine, and the myrtle tree. That made up the material you could use. Uh, and of course, usually the palm leaf was for the roof and so forth for your booth that they uh, celebrated after Passover the coming out of the land. But at the important, at the, the fall fellowship, it is written and thought by most students of God's word, yours included, this one included, of course, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the spring, caught off guard, I should say. But usually it is thought that he would return at the Feast of Trumpets. That is to say, um, the five-month period of the locust is even May through September, and September would fall at approximately that uh, time. That here, this myrtle tree would be mentioned at Christ's return, and that's kind of what the book of Zechariah is about. Coming out of Babylon, and Christ returned. That's why I think it's important that I explain the myrtle just a little bit. The myrtle um, had a uh, beautiful, beautiful flower, and its fragrance would put the rose to shame. They were uh, picked, and, and they dressed up the hut, if you would, and caused this beautiful fragrance. And even many of you today, whether you realize it or not, those flowers are clipped before totally right dried and then brought forth, and that's what's called allspice, okay, a seasoning. So, um, without digression, we'll, we'll add that so that you understand there's always more said to our Father's Word if you take the time to meditate upon it 
because he uses nature itself a great deal. They're not up on the hill, they're down in the bottom, and they grow in bottoms as well. Verse 9, continuing. Um, then said I, O oh my Lord, this is what the prophet asked, O oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said, said unto me, I will show thee what these be. In other words, explaining God's point in sending these. Ten. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. They are scouts that are sent ahead to find out if the time is right, if the harvest is ready, to check out the earth, to check your temperature. Are they listening? Are they studying? Are they biblically illiterate? How do we count this thing? Verse 11. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. They're down there crying, peace, peace, peace. They've worked them up a, a, a one world system, a new world order. They've all worked them up and they're saying peace and it's still, and, but they're still fighting a little bit and so forth. But um, it's one not long till the shaking because there's only one prince of peace and that's he that shall come, the desire of the nations. Verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? How long is that? Well, uh, a, um, a score is 20, so three times 20 would be 60 plus 10 would be 70 years, the time length of the captivity. So now we know that the prophecy has to do with coming out of Babylon, coming out of the captivity, and how uh, the scouts sent to see if the people had learned their lesson, just as it is in the world today, how well have people learned their lessons? Well, it's obvious not very well. It is absolute that people no longer know how to discipline their children, period. When children begin shooting down children, somebody's at fault. And I've got a pretty good idea who I would put the blame to, with the exception of certain circumstances. There's no discipline whatsoever, and this world is ripe, if it ever was in, in history, ripe for harvest at this time. And I feel that it's not that long until we're going to see that harvest. I don't know, how are you doing? This is the coming out, 70 years, 13. And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. Our Father will always comfort you and have good words for you if you will love him and even attempt to follow him. 14. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, and that, that means shout. Don't just be mumbo jumbo about it. Get it out there, cry it out, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous of Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And our Father is a jealous God. We learn that in that great song of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And why would he be jealous of Jerusalem? Because Mount Zion in Jerusalem is his favorite spot in the whole universe. And that's real easy to document. It's in the 16th chapter of Ezekiel that he makes it very clear. He made a covenant with that geographical location saying, this is where my eternal throne shall be established. In the rejuvenated new earth age, the new city, the one that he builds, the one he brings with him, Verse 15, and I am sore displeased with the 
heathen, let's translate that nations, okay? That's what it's talking about. The heathen nations that are at ease, that they don't care. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped um, uh, forward the affliction. Um, they did, they punished my children more than I intended them to. They seemed to enjoy it and get, uh, he's, they are at ease or they're indifferent. Um, and uh, God was very displeased with them, the nations, the way that uh, people would lose uh, the very meaning of God's word and who they were or what they were supposed to do. Verse 16, therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it. Do you want to know where the Lord's house will be built? In it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. I'm going to lot it out. I'm going to lay it out. And of course, Many of us know the dimensions of the Millennium Temple as they are given in the closing chapters from chapter 40 forward in the great book of Ezekiel. And uh, that's exactly how it will be. Our Father, there's, He's not going off out in some cloud and boom boom land. He's coming here, the same as Christ is coming here, and nobody's going anywhere. It's all going to happen right here. So that's why you want to believe this pie in the sky. You want to be very careful of this pie in the sky by and by stuff. You got it right now if you partake of it. If you return to him, he will return to you. It's unconditional as to when. It's now. Now that's not to say that his true return, nationally speaking, I feel is very soon. But this gives you the where where it's going to take place. It would be for this reason that Christ would say in Matthew chapter 24, they asked him what it was going to be like when he came back at the second advent. And he said, these buildings will not be standing. Um, there won't be one stone left standing. In other words, dimensions change, number one, and I won't go into that, but it's making room for the new millennium temple 70, after, the, after Satan stands there. 17. Cry yet, you continue to say, saying, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. In other words, there's going to be good times for those that follow me. And the Lord shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Naturally, having already chosen and having already um, made that eternal, it wasn't just a few year covenant he made with Zion, it's eternal. It's his favorite spot in the universe. Take all the planets, stars, and what have you. And Jerusalem, Zion, in the dimension in which our Father dwells, is his favorite place. Is there a reason for it? Of course there is. He made it to suit himself he created it, rather, to suit himself, and he doesn't like man hankying with it. He's jealous. As a matter of fact, if you want to better understand the jealousy, he fell in love with her and took her to wife. He stipulates in the 16th chapter of Ezekiel that she had an unclean birth and wasn't swaddled. That means a clean birth. Why? Well, because she was formed by the Jebusites. And the city was Jebus at that time, and David conquered it and changed the name to Jerusalem. Now, many people that are biblically illiterate claim, well, that chapter has to do with prayer to stop bleeding. It's not even talking about. It. It's talking about a baby being born in unsanitary conditions. Uh, what some people teach is amazing. It really is, uh, but be that as it may. Verse 18. Then lifted I up mine eyes, and I saw, and behold, four horns. Now, it's important that we spend a little bit of time on these four horns. Horns are always symbolic of powers. These happen to be four external enemy 
agencies of God and all the people of the earth. Meaning naturally that they're controlled by Satan. These are the four hidden dynasties that are with us daily and have been from, from the beginning. Created by Cain and his children and uh, picked uh, forwarded by them into all they can uh, brainwash or mindset to come aboard in these controlling agencies. Do you wish to know what they are? Well, I'm glad because I'm going to tell you. The first is political. The power of the political horn. In other words, through politics, the new world order is founded whereby the world is pretty well controlled through political means. Now, that gets interesting and alone, you know, well, if everything was a correct republic, that would be well and fine, but it isn't. And following the political would come the, um, let, let's say, education. And education is used against not only children, but if you have the ability to, through media and otherwise, to educate a people or to brainwash them or to mindset them, and it really irritates me that even through advertising in this generation, mindset and brainwashing uh, has come forth by people trying to change uh, history or the way things actually are by peoples uh, being spokesmen for, for spokespersons for people they're definitely biblically not a spokesman for. And on and on it goes. Not that God is, is a word that is written to any particular people other than say the people that follow him. But people are educated by the system whereby they um, follow as they will. And um, within that, they absolutely are brainwashed as to reality. Some of the history I've lived myself, when I see portrayals of it by movies and advertising and so forth, it, it is so distant you wouldn't recognize it. But it's not because... Uh, a, an historian attempted to repeat the story. It is strictly written to brainwash people into making popular things that are against God's word. And uh, I resent it. And I suppose that's very obvious. Now back to that political or governmental Many people think that the New World Order doesn't exist uh, when I first began teaching, speaking of it, but now you don't have to worry because it's advertised. And the political is so very strong that if somebody sneezes in Asia, we have the hidden dynasty of the economy that comes into play. To show you that you have a one world economy, if somebody sneezes in Asia, the American stock market gets the Asian flu. And you that are familiar with the market, you know what I'm talking about. Our, our market took a beating because of what happened in Asia. And don't ever let anyone tell you they're not connected. And many people think, uh, well, uh, that couldn't be. Well, many people are so poorly educated that they think, for example, that the Federal Reserve uh, bank is a part of our government. Well, it's called the Federal Reserve. Now, isn't it convenient that private owners named it that just because some stoop would think it was part of the government? We owe our souls to the company store and our government is not the Federal Reserve banking system. It's privately owned. Trillions we owe. Who do we owe? Well, it's very unpopular to go past that point. It's even dangerous. But uh, nevertheless, that's the truth. Check it out. If you, 
if you're not familiar with that, and the world is controlled by the economy lowering the living standards in one area whereby and raising in another. Do you know how many millions we had to donate to the billions to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund? Somebody gets in hot water and we bail them out. You, you pay for it. Some politician goes off to another country and says, oh, we should spend about 160 million here, it won't hurt. Well, it just so happens we're the ones that pay those millions. And am, am, am I against helping uh, underprivileged people? No. I just want you to see the control. That's what's important, that that hidden horn of the world economy would come forth. So there you have political, the uh, education, and the economy, and you got one more. And it's probably, in many cases, the most wicked of all. It's called religion. Many people, by controlling religion, by translating for Christians, when Christians have lost the ability to translate for themselves, then they don't know what the manuscripts say. They have to take someone's word for it. Does it make you comfortable when you must let your eternal soul rest on the ability of some non-Christian to tell you what the manuscript should say in, in the book of Isaiah or in this book of Zechariah. So Christians had better have enough teachers that can translate for themselves. I spoke just very recently about this nonsensical thing by the higher critics floating around now that Jesus Christ had children. Talk about a bunch of idiots, and you know, some people get upset because I use the word idiot. Well, that's what an idiot is. is somebody that teaches something that is absolutely idiocy. That as a, the term to be betrothed to a Christian concerning the bride of Christ to Christ himself, only a Christian can understand that. It means the wedding that will happen at the end. Not that Christ had some wedding when he walked the earth, and that's usually the way a non-Christian would look at it. Because if Christ was betrothed, it would have to be while he was here, wouldn't it? No, it wasn't. It wouldn't. Because he's returning. So those being, those four hidden dynasties, and you'd better be familiar with them, because they by and enlarge. And the hidden dynasty of education is one that really rips me, and I'm so thankful that our Father has given us a platform that goes around the world that we can make people aware of facts to try to keep their heads screwed on right, where they recognize falsification in advertising, news reports, or in movies of falseness that is tried and is, hey, they're good. They're very good. The leading roles filled by what never was in history. You better think about it. I don't know, does it anger you a little bit too? I love all of God's children, but I like history and data to be correct. And I'm very suspicious of people that hanky with it. I don't like it because it's always for a devious reason to twist truth to a lie. Always devious. I'll say it again. It's always devious or of the devil to twist truth to a lie or a falsehood. Watch the Four Hidden Dynasties. Well, I intended to complete this chapter. I didn't do it, did I? Well, be that as it may. Don't miss any of this book of Zechariah. It is so pertinent to this generation and to this time in history that you need to know every word of it, for it is your Father asking you to return to His truth and recognize who your hidden enemies are. Because your enemies do not wear signboards saying, I be the enemy of God's children. 
Do you think Satan is that stupid? That's what some people would teach you with this 666 business. They say it's a sign out here saying, I'm the devil's little child. It's in the brain, and many Christians have already wearing it in their brain because they are not familiar with God's Word. It's not a generation to go to sleep in. Hope you enjoyed that. Your Father loves you. I hope you love Him. Return to Him. Won't you do that? All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please?